Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. We are officially into earnings season, one of our uh, kind of favorite few weeks of each quarter. Uh, the vast majority of S&P 500 companies will be releasing their third quarter results over the week and a half, two weeks ahead. Um, and so we launched that here today, Thursday, and uh, we'll get into the meat of it next week. But um, the few things I wanted to kind of cover this week, I'm going to take straight from the playbook of what I've written. I printed out the written Dividend Cafe, which I often don't do, but I want to make sure we cover a lot of these same topics. The, um, the big themes that we wrote about this week have to do with those still maintaining a confusion around what seems to be a lot of the political distress and even dysfunction. Some may even call it failure and yet the market uh, success that has taken place here over the last um, 11, almost 12 months. The market is up over 25% since the election, and yet a lot of people find themselves saying, well, geez, it doesn't look as if a lot of that economic agenda of the incoming Trump administration has gotten implemented. And one of the things we want to point out this week is, first of all, what we've been pointing out all year. The markets are largely advancing on earnings growth and the um, getting extra kicker out of the fact that there's been a global uh, harmonization of economic growth. You've had positive economic movement improvement in most, at most uh, geographies around the world, and that's a very rare case, uh, but certainly one that, that uh, helps justify a certain bullish backdrop in risk assets. You still have very low inflation. You still have very low interest rates. And in most central banks, you have uh, cases of ongoing uh, accommodation and so forth. And, and so it's not really that hard to understand why valuations are allowed to move even higher and overall risk assets have done well. But in the face of the belief that things are not really going well for the political environment, um, I would I kind of summarize this week four categories in which the market would like to have seen some assist from Washington, D.C. in this incoming Trump administration, and that's in the area of corporate tax reform. You know what that all entails, a reduction of corporate tax rates, repatriation of foreign profits, a territorial tax system, elimination of loopholes, things of that nature. Secondly, would be in personal individual rates, not only flatter rates and reduced rates, uh, less rates, period, simplification, and I think things like a repeal of AMT would fit into this. Uh, you could call the benefits coming to pass-through entities, a combination of business tax and personal tax um, reform, um, allowing S-Corps and LLCs and partnerships to be taxed more favorably. Uh, the financial deregulation side is sort of that third category, and then infrastructure. And so you have four areas in which you could say, okay, the markets were hoping to get an assist from the Trump administration and, and maybe even uh, not only hoping but planning on it. Well, those are not really uh, the areas in which they've had some difficulties. Um, the fact of the matter is the most stunning one politically that still kind of hangs over, I think, the Republican Congress and the White House is the lack of repeal, replace on Obamacare. That is not as market sensitive as a political event. It's a momentous event if it were to have happened, but it's not necessarily as market sensitive. But to the extent that these other four categories are all still very much alive and well, it shouldn't be a big confusion as to why the market hasn't responded negatively. Um, if all these things get done, I think the market will respond even more positively. And if all four of them die, I think the market will, in fact, respond negatively. But to the extent there's still an overall um, optimism that things are going to get done, um, one way or the other. There'll be improvement in those four categories. Um, now, in the case of deregulation, we think that that ball has started to move downfield a bit. It doesn't require legislation. And there's been significant um, on the executive branch level, uh, both with personnel, with prioritization, with internal memos, with selective enforcement, with a whole number of tools available. There's been um, movement in the deregulation side of business, the economy, particularly in financials and energy, things of that nature. Um, but yes, the tax reform bill still requires some big votes, and those are, are not there yet. Uh, we suspect that that vote will be um, there before Christmas. Um, and in fact, if it isn't, it may, it may, they may have bigger problems. 
But as it stands now, the Senate has authorized up to about a trillion and a half dollars of room to play with that can come back. I think that once the, the bill comes out of the budget uh, process at Senate and all the lobbyists get a hold of all the details and start making moves on how they want to turn knobs and, and, and pick at this, pick at that, you could end up seeing that number go down, but that number cannot go up. They don't have room within their parliamentary procedure if they're going to do this at less than 60 votes. So essentially, um, there's not a lot of wiggle room out there. The plan as it stands, um, recognizing there's still some pieces that need to be filled in, um, we think would be very pro-growth and stimulative. And uh, politically, um, I think it's, it's going to pass. It's not a slam dunk. Uh, a lot of things have been um, uh, moving around, but we would still say it's about a 60% chance of uh, being able to move through. And, and uh, if, if, if it doesn't come together, then likely something different will that will not be as uh, positive for markets. So we, we keep our eye on it. Um, I want to shift gears real quick before I wrap up to Japan. A lot of time spent summarizing some of the things we've worked on uh, regarding Japan over the last several months. Some pretty significant research project I've undertaken. I've, I've dedicated a certain part of each day for about three months now to further researching this macro story. And the long and short of it is laid out at DividendCafe.com. But yes, we are uh, preparing to take a position as equity holders in, in uh, Japanese companies for the first time in my career. Um, it's been an extremely value-added omission from client portfolios over the years. But right now, we believe that the very long-term deflationary cycle hangover Japan has been in, um, that the impact of that to equity markets will start to flatline that corporate profits will begin growing and in fact have begun growing and that corporate profits as a percentage of GDP will begin growing providing certain bottom-up opportunities to, to add value in our portfolio. We also further believe that the very low dividend payout ratio is not competitive now even with emerging markets let alone other developed markets like US and Europe and that we're going to see significant dividend growth out of Japan. At our market Epicurean property this week, we wrote, I wrote an article that does delve into some of the risks there. There's still um, some very complex situations in Japan on a monetary policy basis. Um, it is still obviously an extraordinarily indebted nation, um, but we are talking particularly about individual companies that we think are at a spot in the cycle that represent attractive buying opportunity and we're willing to take that risk. So read through that uh, a bit more. Let us know if you have questions. Um, you know, I, I think I've probably gone on long enough here. We're very excited for earnings season. There's an awful lot uh, that we're going to be looking to. We do not look to earnings season because we have a significant care about a company that one quarter, you know, there had an inventory backlog and another quarter maybe, uh, you know, sales were down a little and, there, you know, th things are going to fluctuate. Every company we own is a company, and all companies have a certain seasonality to their execution and, and the way that they perform relative to expectations. But we intend to be long-term holders of the companies that we own, and other than when certain circumstances force us out. So the quarterly movements are not because we're looking to trade in and out stocks. It's because we want to see that the free cash flow growth that we invest in is still surfacing, and we want to get indication from management about their commitment to protecting that free cash flow growth and protecting the dividend that we uh, value. And sometimes these quarterly results help us to see certain half-baked merger ideas or, or uh, large um, uh, uh, assumptions of debt that we think could hamper their balance sheet and its ability to, to continue growing the dividend. Um, we get a lot of strategic and tactical updates in the companies we own out of these quarterly results. Stock prices can move around. Outperforming expectations usually makes the stock go up. Underperforming usually makes it go down. We don't usually get too excited about it. Sometimes the stock will have a bad quarter. The longer term thesis is still in play and enables us to come in and enter the position. We've done some of that this year, as a matter of fact. Um, but that's, that's the story. So you'll hear a lot more about earnings season and tax reform in the next uh, few weeks. Those are the two big stories. Um, but fundamentally, the thing is long term, uh, those haven't changed since last week, and uh, they're not going to change this coming week either. 
uh, a relentless commitment to behavior modification, investor temperament, and a relentless commitment to fundamentals and deriving risk premium out of the investments we hold on behalf of clients to advance their own personal financial goals. We are working very, very hard for you. Uh, we love what we do. Please reach out with any questions, and thanks for listening to Dividend Cafe.